Good morning, and welcome to the Wednesday, March 10th, 2021 meeting of the House Education Finance Committee. Remote hearings such as this are held in accordance with House Rule 10.01. This rule has been posted online and is linked to in our public meeting notice on the House website. All remote hearings will be recorded and live streamed by House Public Information Services. Members, as you know, you have the contents of today's meeting or for today's meeting in your vir virtual packets available to you and for the public, these materials have also been posted online. Members, if you're looking for all these items in one place, they're attached in the calendar event you have that Ms. Burt sent for today. To get on the list to be recognized by the chair, members using the Zoom interface have the ability to raise their hand via the app. Ms. Burt will place your name on the list to be recognized. Ms. Sunderland, would you please call the roll? Chair Dabney. Present. Vice Chair Sandstead. Present. Representative Cresha. Present. Representative Bennett. Present. Representative Daniels. Present. Representative Damoth. Present. Representative Draskowski. Here. Representative Erickson. Present. Representative Feist. Present. Representative Jordan. Present. Representative Marquardt. Present. Representative Mueller. Present. Representative Richardson. Present. Representative Thompson. Representative Thompson. Representative Wolgamont. Representative Wolgamont. Representative Zhang. Present. Representative Yuakim. Present. That is the role, and we do have a quorum. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Sunderland. Uh, members, uh, today the committee will be hearing two bills. House file 1742 and House file 1712. First up is House file 1742. Members, our intention is to lay this bill over for possible inclusion by 1055 this morning. Uh, Representative Jordan, would you like to move House file 1742 to be before the committee to lay over for possible inclusion or for further consideration at a later date? So move, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Jordan. Representative Berg, welcome to the Education Finance Committee. Uh, did you bring treats? I it's did just, not. <laughs> some traditions are just harder in a virtual environment, uh, Representative Berg. We'll look forward to treats next year. There will be treats next year. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I do have an author's amendment, as you can all see in your packet. Um, this amendment makes a number of clarifying changes supported by the School Nurses of Minnesota. It also drops language at 2.30 relating to contracting for services. This is already allowed under the Uniform Financial Accounting and Reporting Standards in current practice with the Minnesota Department of Education. Thank you, Representative Berg. Uh, Representative Jordan, would you be good enough to move the A1 uh, amendment to be before the committee? Yes, Mr. Chair, I move the A1 amendment. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Berg, this is to get the bill in the order that you prefer? Yes. With that, members, uh, all those in favor of the Jordan motion uh, on the A1 author's amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Jordan. Representative Berg, now that the bill is before us as amended, please introduce your bill. Mr. Chair and members, thank you for hearing House File 1742 today. I'm honored to bring this before the committee and I'm so incredibly excited to partner with Senator Mary Kunish-Podine who is carrying this bill in the Senate. About a year ago, Minnesota Minnesotans normal day-to-day -day life was disrupted. Students, educators, and parents had to learn to navigate distance learning. We all had to learn to mute and unmute ourselves on Zoom and our daily interactions with friends families and colleagues became so much more precious. Over the past year, students, parents, educators, and legislators have learned to adjust to the shift. But several realities have become clear. Our students need more support, mental health supports, social emotional supports, and of course, health supports. 
This bill would provide ongoing sustainable funding to every school district and charter school in Minnesota to allow schools to prioritize these supports. Districts would receive at least $35,000 in funding to hire a school nurse, school counselor, chemical dependency counselor, social worker, and or psychologist. Minnesota has 6,000 fewer school counselors, social workers, school nurses, and school psychologists than necessary to meet the needs of our students. We know student support personnel close opportunity gaps. School social workers provide children in need with access to transportation, academic supports, counseling, basic nutrition, and in some cases, they help students find housing. School nurses are often the only medical professionals a student will see for months. Nurses educate students on allergies, mental health, hygiene, and emotional regulation. School counselors and psychologists provide education on social emotional learning through a racial justice lens. I have had so many conversations with my constituents about the need to have a school counselor in every building. We know that school counselors provide comprehensive supports throughout the school, both to students as well as staff. They focus on social emotional support, academic support, and career support both individually or in groups. This bill is really important to me because it speaks to my own personal story. My son, Jake, uh, is what I like to call a non-traditional learner, a smart kid with a beautiful mind that just sits in his classroom, not taking any, up, any space, not calling attention to himself, but just lost in his own head. And as I advocated for him almost full time throughout his elementary and middle school years, I found that school counselors were part-time, split between several campuses, and unable to really take a deep dive into the student body and assess their needs. For us, by the time Jake got to high school, it was too late. It had been years of why am I not <clears throat> smart enough? Why can't I do what the other kids can do? <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Take your time. <laughs> When we finally did get to high school and we found that full-time school counselor that could meet Jake where he was at, that could provide Jake a space to work in and somebody that understood him. He's 19 years old and he is still finishing up credits at Burnsville Alternative High School because we failed him. Our education system failed him. And this is not a unique story. That's the worst part. And it's not even the worst trauma that our kids come to school with. We know that kids can't learn on an empty stomach. They can't learn if their traumas are not addressed. This was true before COVID and it's gonna be true long after COVID. This is the focus of my community, but I know other communities might face different needs. They might need the more intensive supports offered by school social workers or psychologists. They may need to expand or even hire their first school nurse to meet the increasing challenges of our medically complex students. This is why the bill provides local control to hire the student support personnel most needed in their community. Lastly, I want to just flag an important but relatively small part of the bill. Subdivision two of the appropriations beginning at line 3.17 includes funding to re-specialize and recruit more student support personnel. This is focused both on recruiting racially diverse student support personnel and on recruiting mental health counselors or social workers or nurses who may be working outside of the school setting. For example, if you work for the county as a social worker, they typically pay you during your clinical practice requirement. This is not the reality in our schools and can create a real barrier to entry for folks who would otherwise want to be supporting our students. Mr. Chair and members, I have a number of testifiers with me today, as well as staff from the Minnesota Department of Education available to answer any tech technical questions. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Berg. Uh, I, I do have a list of testifiers. Uh, first on my list is Cab excuse me, Caleb Willis, a school counselor at Maple Grove Middle School. Mr. Willis, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Uh, Caleb Willis, um, good morning, Mr. Chair and members of uh, the committee. Again, my name is Caleb Willis and I'm the only black male licensed school counselor in my school district, Oslo area schools. As a school counselor, I provide students with the support in the domains of academic, social, emotional, and college and career exploration 
My role this year has been divided between servicing 350 eighth grade students at Maple Grove Middle School and 340 uh, sixth through eighth grade students from four middle schools within our district that are enrolled in our distance learning academy and online school created this year in response to the pandemic. Um, here are some things that we do as school counselors pre-pandemic and currently we register um, mostly all our students uh, transition from fifth grade to sixth grade and current middle school grades um, and the transition from middle school to high school. Conduct schedule changes for an entire caseload. Uh, we do individual and group counseling. And our common concerns are ADHD, anxiety, depression, suicide ideation, racism, gender identity, family change, grief and loss, and increasing our students' social skills. We intersect between disciplinary action using restorative practices and mental health support in collaboration with administration and parents. Uh, we conduct mental health referrals with school-based partnerships such as Lee Crossing Center and Prairie Care. Academically, we facilitate student goal setting using motivational interviewing skills to help students achieve um, by weekly academic check-ins. We intervene in attendance and truancy for collaborating with parents, teachers, administration, and uh, Hennepin County. And the list goes on, but I know that as time, for time's sake, I can tell you all the responsibilities that we have. Um, I must keep it real and honest. I'm not enough for my caseload of 690 students. If it had not been for my two gracious colleagues for taking part of my Maple Grove caseload, I would be serving 793 students in totality. Um, American School Council Association recommends a ratio of 250 to 1. According to the U.S. Department of Education, Minnesota ranks 49th with a ratio of 792 to 1. If I feel that I'm not enough, then you can imagine the way our students feel, especially for students of color, who too often uh, felt the inferiority of this system. Minnesota is one of the worst states for a student of color. Further, this state is one of the worst for an African-American to live. Minnesota ranked second worst in the U.S. for racial, uh, for racial equality. The racial gaps or racial disparities within the state ring aloud when examining the achievement gap, socioeconomic gap, housing gap, and healthcare access. Yet those in power have been toned deaf to these problems that have perpetuated themselves for decades. When will it matter to save the lives for our students? I ask this because I am the black student that was free of reduced lunch and has overcome the statistic that would have condemned me to a life of peril had it not been for two change agents. John Hester and Chloe Barnwell, school counselors who saved my life in high school, to have the opportunity to speak before you here today. But we had a critical moment in time where we as collective units of teachers, school counselors, social workers, school psychologists, nurses, educational support staff, engineers, cooks, principal, board members, and legislators must choose the kind of future we want to help foster for all our students to feel they have a sense of belonging and adequate support. In essence, we together are a multidisciplinary team that can be a tide of change. However, for far too long, we have not had enough student support services which have plagued our schools. Today, there's a call to action for transformational leadership. There's a great need for transformation and funding necessary support for all of our students and their families. Mr. It's Willis, if you could uh, wrap up, please. Okay. Um, last but not least, Martin Luther King said the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands at the moment of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. The true neighbor will risk his position, his prestige, and even his life for the welfare of others. Please support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next on my list is Jackie Trinska, school counselor at Osseo Senior High School. Ms. Trinska, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Dabney and members of the committee for taking the time to visit with us this morning. My name is Jackie Trezinka, and I am a school counselor in the Osseo Area School District, um, specifically at Osseo Senior High School. And one of the things I want to share with you, Caleb did a great job of kind of explaining the overall role of a school counselor. Um, one of the things I want to highlight as a high school counselor, especially over the course of the last year with the pandemic, um, is the um, especially for our upperclassmen looking at college and career options after high school, their plans have all of a sudden become very uncertain. So students that 
had made plans. They'd done college visits. They had everything ready to go, maybe to move out of state, maybe to go to um, the college of their dreams that isn't in Minnesota close to their family. Now, all of a sudden, things have changed. Um, we're seeing fewer applications to schools outside um, of Minnesota. We're also seeing um, applications down in general and students really kind of at this point of not being sure what to do. And so while this is an immediate piece that we're talking about right now at high school with our seniors, this is also something that impacts our ninth, 10th and 11th graders. The way they have thought about their futures has really changed in the last year. And that has impacted their social and emotional well-being. It's impacted their academics. Um, it's kind of a weight they're carrying around. So I wanted to highlight that in particular um, because the relationships we have with our students has become very critical in being able to help students really navigate what's happening in their lives right now. Um, as Caleb said, school counselors and high school is, is the same. We work with basically three umbrellas, um, academic, personal, social, and then that career and college readiness planning. Our main challenges right now, Caleb talked about ratios. I want to talk a little bit about just the stability of staff and services. Many of our student support services and especially school counselors are funded through compensatory dollars, which can change from year to year. Without consistent funding for these services, we kind of are starting over every year. It's hard to build relationships with students and families in the school community, as well as to build partnerships and specifically even programs and practices and processes have to be kind of reevaluated um, and reorganized. So that stability of funding is really a key piece of this to be able to staff schools and give students and families what they need from year to year to be able to build those interventions and to be able to sustain them. Because we know that students that have that skill building, that prevention and that intervention work early on, that K-12 program, um, really that goes on for their entire life. That has an impact on our larger Minnesota students and families and it's an investment. Thank you, Ms. Trzinska. Appreciate your time. You. Uh, next on my list is Molly Fox, school social worker from Mankato and president of the School Social Workers Association. Ms. Uh, Ms. Fox, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Molly Fox. Um, good morning, Honorable Chair Jim Davney and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Molly Fox and I'm a licensed clinical school social worker and I'm the current president of the Minnesota School Social Work Association as well as the lead school social worker and homeless liaison for Mankato Area Public Schools. I've been practicing school social work for the past 22 years. I'm here to ask you to support House File 1742 bill that will provide urgently needed funding for student support services personnel. School social workers work with all students in our districts across Minnesota. Uh, for example, I work in a district that has 84 students and we have 10 school social workers supporting youth and families with our student support teams. Our work is evidence and prevention based. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I have witnessed firsthand the devastating impact that COVID has had on mental health of our children. School social workers participate in regular discussions about the toll this pandemic has taken on our youth within our school districts across the state. School social workers and other student support personnel on the front lines have witnessed unprecedented stress, negatively impacting the physical, social, emotional, and psychological well-being of our students, some who are already struggling with mental health challenges. This has neg negatively impacted attendance in school and the ability for our kids to engage in learning while in school. We have also witnessed parents struggling to navigate working from home, assisting one or more children with distance le learning, all while trying to manage their own mental health and mental health needs of their children. We know that pre-COVID, one in four children have already been exposed to at least one adverse childhood experience, one traumatic event. The pandemic has exasperated the problem. We know that our students and their families are increasingly experiencing social, isola social isolation, food and housing insecurity, parental job loss, domestic violence, negative social media effects, racialized trauma associated with the increased acts of violence, 
on communities of color and stress associated with dealing with fluctuating school transitions. During this pandemic, we have increased our connections and support with families and students by meeting with them at their front door, bringing food to homes for community food partners, dropping off school supplies, getting computer chargers to home, hotspots dropped off for access, and partnering with parents, sharing tips and tools to support their children's mental health during this crisis. We have worked closely with students and parents staying connected via endless virtual meetings, group and individual mental health support, their social emotional needs, as well as continue to connect specific resources for stability. When this pandemic starts to dissipate and becomes under control, there will still be the need for increased mental health support and access. On behalf of the school social workers across the state of Minnesota, I urge you to, to support House File 1742, a bill that will provide critical funding for student support personnel each year. The investment we make now is critical for us to minimize the harm of our kids and set them back on the path to a bright future. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Fox. Next on my list is Jolie Holland, licensed school nurse. Uh, Ms. Holland, welcome to the committee. Well, no, welcome back to the committee. Please state your name for the record and please proceed with your testimony. My name is Jolie Holland, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm a second generation school nurse and I serve as the chairperson of the Legislative Committee for the School Nurse Organization of Minnesota, or SNOM. We represent licensed school nurses or LSNs working in school districts across the state. And SNOM deeply wants to thank Representative Berg for HF 1742. We strongly support the A1 amendment that clarifies the health specialist position at the Minnesota Department of Education. There was a licensed school nurse at MDE, but she retired. Now we don't have this valuable resource and the position is critical. And LSN understands the challenges we face and can give direction about safe practices and procedures, along with so much more. Our current Minnesota law established in 1986 requires an LSN only if there are 1,000 students or more in a district. So whether a, a district has 1,000 or 10,000 students, they're only required to employ one licensed school nurse. Any less than 1,000 and no school nurse is required. This is a terrible ratio. And the situation has become far worse because with advances in medical treatment, children who would have died are now thankfully being saved and are in the school system, but often with significant health issues. In my own district of over 1,600 students, I have over 14 schools and programs with seven locations that I might be called to. I often get emergency calls for students related to their medical conditions. We have over 70 students with asthma, 11 students from preschool to high school with diabetes, seizure disorders, severe depression, and mental health issues. We have heart conditions, life-threatening allergies, tracheostomies, gastric tubes, transplants, COVID-19, just to name a few. A school nurse may be the only source of health care for some students. They might not have insurance or reliable transportation, or they can't afford medical care. I've had students who will beg me, please don't call my parents. We, they can't afford to take me to the doctor, and it breaks my heart. Many health offices are staffed with secretaries or health care professionals who have only basic first aid, CPR, and AED training. We pride ourselves here in Minnesota on our world-renowned excellence in medical care, but tragically, in a recent survey by Spotlight in America, it estimated that approximately one-third of Minnesota school districts don't have a school nurse. We also don't track health data, student health data in Minnesota. We would love to work with any legislator who would help us improve this situation, and we support this bill. And so I say to each one of you listening to me, Every student deserves a school nurse. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Holland. Next on my list is Shana Morse, Assistant Director of Minnesota Department of Education. Ms. Morse, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Shana Morse. I am the Assistant Director of Government Relations for the Department of Education. I am joined by my colleague and Director of MDE School uh, Climate Center, uh, Mr. Craig Weathington, as well. 
I'm testifying this morning in support of House File 1742, a proposal that was also included in House File 1065, the Governor's Biennial Budget. So thank you to Representative Berg for authoring this bill and to the chair for hearing it. The proposal supports student social, emotional, and physical health by addressing shortages of student support services personnel within Minnesota schools. Student challenges such as absenteeism, behavior and discipline issues, violence, truancy, and dropping out altogether can often be linked to unmet social, emotional, and physical health needs that significantly impact students' academic achievements. Now we know that the work of school counselors, social workers, school psychologists, school nurses, and chemical dependency counselors help our students in these areas. Unfortunately, in fiscal year 2017, Minnesota had just one school counselor for every 659 students. The student to counselor ratio was 45% over the national average of 455 students per counselor. Only four other states had higher student to counselor ratios, ratios than Minnesota. And so there was a need for more student support personnel before the COVID-19 pandemic, and it has only grown since. This proposal will provide needed funding directly to schools to address the issue of inadequate student access to support personnel across the state so that students can show up more prepared for learning and for academic success. This funding will not only give students more access to school support personnel, it will also help decrease caseloads for existing staff in order to support more effective and comprehensive services and improve outcomes in career and college success. Internally at the department, the proposal would create a school health services specialist position to coordinate guidance and training for districts and schools statewide as they implement or deepen their coordinated school health work. We would also, also uh, appreciate the authors and committee's consideration of the original intent of the proposal around shortages in personnel and support broadly. We know that the amendment that was adopted touches on these two areas and we're committed to continuing conversations on those items. Continuing with supporting districts and schools, a critical component of supporting districts and schools in this area is ensuring that there are school support personnel to bring on board, which is why the proposal takes a multifaceted approach by also funding a workforce development initiative to increase the number of student support personnel each year. This workforce development initiative will bring together higher ed institutions, <coughs> student support personnel associations, state agencies, and community-based mental health providers to focus on increasing the number of personnel, uh, personnel of color, as well as re-specialization, recruitment, and retention, as you've heard, to make sure that we're supporting a strong candidate pool for districts and schools to hire from. Thank you again for your consideration of this bill. Mr. Wellington and I are happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Uh, one last brief uh, testifier. Marissa McClure, uh, K-5 school counselor. Ms. McClure, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you for your time. My name is Marissa McClure and I am a school counselor, a K-8 school counselor. I work with Phoenix School Counseling, which is an LLC where I work with three different schools. Um, so I'm just gonna make this really quick. My caseload is 1,012 students the, and I work four days a week uh, over three different schools. Obviously, you can see the issue there. Um, the, when the ratio is supposed to be 250 to 1. I completely and utterly support this bill. Um, so thank you, Kayla Berg, for bringing this up. I can only, every single day, I work very closely with my nurse here. Uh, we don't have a social worker, but um, I have before in other schools. It's an imperative. And I'm a psychologist. So um, these students, just to kind of give a personal statement, um, my work I am back to back to back I have lots of students on my waiting list and a lot of my colleagues that I work with have the same issues and struggles and that's obviously not supporting our students um, and even I guess more not wonderful is um, four out of 14 of people in my cohort have had to move out of state to find jobs um, these are very educated people, and it's very sad to see them leave, and myself included. I may have to move out of state, and I love Minnesota, to be able to find a job where in a, in a state where they have funding and they respect positions like school supports. So um, with that being said, I fully, fully support this bill. I hope you do, too. Our kids um, need support workers. Our teachers need them. Our parents need them. So thank you very much for your consideration and time. Thank you, Ms. McClure. Uh, member, or to the public, when this hearing was posted, the public was provided with instructions on how to sign up to testify during the public portion of the bill hearing. We received no requests for the, from the public to testify. Questions from members? Seeing none, uh, 
Well, nope, seeing none. All right. Uh, with that, Representative, oh, well, uh, Representative Berg, any closing comments? Sorry, Mr. Chair, uh, there is a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Representative Draskowski, thank you, Ms. Berg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If, if it is uh, in the interest of the legislature and policy to, um, to increase spending for schools, uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, I have heard from my uh, superintendents, my school boards uh, over and again, instead of creating a new cookie cutter category uh, that uh, ties their hands, uh, you might have one school who needs um, all $22 per pupil unit of this to be dedicated to the areas that we've been talking about here today. Another school may only need 11 and maybe uh, maybe needs the other 11 for something else. Why, um, why do we continue to bring forward uh, more inflexible, um, uh, rigid cookie cutter approaches that further complicate uh, the school funding system here in Minnesota, make it less transparent and uh, less um, uh, adaptable and usable for our school districts. I guess that's just a question, uh, maybe for the author. Uh, I've heard those frustrations over and over again, uh, members. So we are, are we trying to become a state school board? That's a question I would have too, maybe for the author. Thank you, Representative Draskowski. Representative Berg, any response? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Dreskowski. Um, I believe it, it states in the bill that there is local control for each school district to decide um, how they need to use those dollars and what is best in the best interest of their students and, and their schools. Um, we're talking about raising up all schools, not lowering the bar by any means. Um, and I'm happy to refer to um, Ms. Snyder for any further explanation on this question. Any follow-up, Representative Draskowski? No, not really. I just wanted to put that out there. Um, we have been seeing this since I've been in the legislature more and more. We've got a very complicated funding system, and it's because of bills like this that come through each time. A particular interest group, we could have a bill to fund more FI ed teachers at uh, $10 per pupil unit. We could have one at $15 per pupil unit for more janitors, um, maybe more air conditioning specialists, um, you know, uh, this is, is not the right way to structure this. And Representative Berg, uh, the most local control we could offer if we're going to, if again, the public policy decision is to give more money to the schools, is to give it to them uh, on the general formula so that they can have full local control. And that is local control. This, I mean, we are telling them in this bill, I read the bill, uh, we're forcing them to write a report uh, so we've got another mandate in there and, and we're going to incur more costs on the schools for this. And I understand the reason for it in the bill, uh, accountability, uh, you know, make sure that the money is spent according to the way the bill is, is written. Um, again, that's not local control. Local control says we trust our school boards, we trust uh, their management and their ability uh, to use the dollars that we give them, the dollars they get from property taxes as well, uh, to do the best job with the kids in their locality. Uh, you know, certainly an, an inner city school uh, that's uh, large would be much different than a rural school that's maybe small. Um, huge dynamics between them. Uh, this is not local control. This is, uh, this is developing, again, a more complicated school funding formula that's less transparent and that uh, uh, turns, again, the legislature and the Department of Education into a state school board. Uh, therefore, Mr. Chair, when you bring this forward, I would think twice about this. And if we're going to if we're going to bring more money into schools, let's uh, let's untie the, the chains and the strings from it and allow the schools to do the best job they can with. That's what I hear over again. I've never heard anything contrary to that in the many, many meetings I've had with school board, um, school boards and superintendents and principals over the years. So uh, thank you um, uh, to the author, uh, Representative Berg and Mr. Chair and members. Thank you, Representative Draskowski. Members, we are over time uh, allotted for this bill at this time. I've got three members on the list. I would ask you to be brief in your comments or questions, and uh, we'll start with Representative Feist. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to make two kind of big picture comments. Um, I think this is a great bill providing really important funding that is uh, more essential now than ever. And I would also like to just comment on kind of the idea that complexity is inherently bad. And when I first uh, joined this committee, that was kind of my impression too. I was like, gosh, this is too complicated. Um, but Tim Strom actually convinced me otherwise. Um, and I see this complexity as a way that we can really make sure that our funding represents our priorities and our values in our schools. Um, so I don't see complexity as inherently bad and, and I really have come to appreciate it. Um, it might just be the nerd in me. And then also, I, I feel like this does create more transparency, because if we just like increase the formula, then we don't really know exactly what schools are doing with that money. And if we know that we are providing this specific funding for this specific priority, then we know where it's going. So I think this is a great bill. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Feist. Representative Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll try to make this quick. I do have a question for the bill author. Um, just want to mention and kind of echo what Representative Drezkowski said. I've spoken with many superintendent school board members and so on, and they, they want more flexibility and more local control with their funds to be able to direct monies as needed. Um, and I, I just feel like though I totally agree with the worthiness of this cause and, and I understand the necessity of school counselors and social workers and nurses and things. I no debate there, but I just, um, the more we carve out these little separate pockets of money, the more we tie the hands of schools to actually innovate and, and utilize the funding they get to really meet the needs of their students in their particular area and in their local schools. So my question for the bill author is, uh, would it not be better, um, Representative Berg, to put this funding onto the, in, in, into the general funding and then maybe perhaps give schools guidance on, you know, this is best practices. This is what, you know, we would like to, to see happen in our schools, but allow them to make those choices locally. I just think local control is the strength we need for our schools right now to help our students. Representative Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Bennett. Uh, I know how devoted to, to students you are, and so I appreciate this question. Um, I do feel like this bill uh, does allow for local control. What it does is dedicate funding for, um, specifically to address the, you know, the mental health needs of our students. Um, and I do think that when the school gets the dollars, they'll best know do we need to hire a psychologist, a school counselor, a chemical dependency counselor, whatever the need is, they can use these dollars to fulfill that. It also um, makes a provision uh, that I think lifts up um, appropriate um, counselors in terms of having students of color be able to go to a counselor that is also a person of color so they see um, themselves reflected in their counselor and they and they have that innate trust. Um, if that uh, doesn't answer your question, I uh, will happily defer to Caitlin Snyder from Education Minnesota. Thank you, Representative Berg. Uh, Representative Bennett, any follow-up? No, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative Ukim, you're uh, last on the list. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just want to thank Representative Berg for bringing this bill forward. We have all seen how much COVID has highlighted the disparities in our school systems even more. And as she said, these have been issues around before COVID, during COVID, and long after COVID. And we've heard our school districts actually come to us and say that they want funds to help provide the support for their students. Time and time again, I do want to draw the committee's attention to lines 2.7 to 2.10 that mentions that districts to be eligible for this, they must decide to apply. This is totally a local control piece. And as for the reporting requirement, I would want them to tell us once they've applied, received this money, how they utilized it. So I just wanna thank you, uh, Representative Berg, and thank you members for the discussion. Thank you, Representative Joachim. Representative Berg, any last comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, I think we've covered it all. I appreciate um, everyone's questions and support. There is no doubt that everybody that sits on this committee has the um, welfare of our students at heart. And I thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. And I urge you to vote yes on this. Thank you, Representative Berg. With that, uh, Representative Jordan renews her motion 
to lay over House File 1742 as amended for possible inclusion in a future bill. Thank you very much, Representative Byrd. Members, next on our uh, list is uh, House File 1712. Representative Zhang, would you like to make a motion to move House File 1712 to be before the committee and laid over for possible inclusion or for further consideration at a later date? So moved, Chair. Thank you very much, Representative Zhang. Representative Keeler, welcome to the Education Finance Committee. Before you introduce your bill, I understand you have an author's amendment you'd like to offer to get the bill in the shape you'd prefer. Uh, members, I will move the A1 amendment to be before the committee to put the bill in the shape that the author desires. Uh, Representative Keeler, do you uh, wish to explain your A1 amendment? I would. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity. It really is something that we realized when we presented it in um, our last committee that was brought to our attention that the timing is not overly um, kind to the fact that we're, we're the goal here is to implement some new data and understanding that we're in the middle of a pandemic and putting more pressure on our um, teachers and staff and faculty um, is not appropriate. And so what the amendment does is it just pushes out um, this implementation um, to, to a future school year. All right, and this is uh, necessary to put the bill in the form that you uh, prefer as the author, correct? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Representative Keeler. With that, uh, members, any discussion to the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the A1 author's amendment, the Dabney motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion prevails. Uh, Representative Keeler, uh, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members, for having me here today to talk about House File 12 or 1712. Um, what we are going to talk about is the world's best workforce. Some of the areas in this um, area is to create a space that we close racial and economic achievement gaps, that all students are prepared for graduation, and that also students have an opportunity to be, to be um, prepared for college and career. Readiness. And so what this bill does, um, it's a student-centered bipartisan effort to um, look at two new data points just to make sure that we're fulfilling those areas. Um, the first data point is to look at our ninth grade class and making sure that they're on track for graduation. What we know is that in our freshman year, um, if we are passing our core courses, it increases our chance to graduate by four times. Um, and that's that's huge. You know, the first step to college and career readiness is high school graduation. Mm -hmm. um, and so this just provides us the opportunity to look at data uh, so that we can put supports that are necessary in place. Um, the second piece is to look at our students who are in rigorous coursework from a desegregated data viewpoint, um, because we know that there's a disproportion um, in our BIPOC community that's taking rigorous coursework. I think many of us have sat in, and heard that this year in different testimonies when we've asked different students if they have heard of these opportunities or participated in any of the, these opportunities. And often the answer is maybe we didn't, but we wish we could have. Um, so what we do with data is when we take data, it tells us the story so that we know how to implement the changes that are most needed. Um, I'm not going to talk much more about it. I do have a couple testifiers here with me today. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you, Representative Keeler. Uh, first on my list is uh, former chair Jennifer Loon, now senior policy fellow with Ed, Ed Allies. Uh, Representative Loon, welcome. Welcome back. Good to uh, see you. Thank you, uh, Chair Dabney and members of the Education Finance Committee. It's really great to be with you. And uh, uh, as you said, uh, my name is Jennifer Loon. I am the Senior Policy Fellow at Ed Allies. And Ed Allies is a statewide education advocacy nonprofit. We partner with educators, families, and communities to ensure that every Minnesota student has access to an engaging and rigorous education. And it's my pleasure to testify in strong support of Representative Keeler's bill, House File 1712. In November 2020, Ed Allies published a research report on rigorous course taking in Minnesota and revealed significant gaps in enrollment in classes like advanced placement, international baccalaureate, PSEO, and concurrent enrollment. We found that disparities in enrollment for BIPOC students starts early with access to gifted and talented programs, particularly for indigenous, Latino, and black students, and that the gap grows as students reach high school where there are more opportunities for rigorous courses. 
One of the recommendations of the report for addressing these disparities is to expand the measurement of career and college readiness goals that schools are required to, re to develop and report as part of their world's best workforce plans. And let me offer a little context around why this measure and why this report. In 2013, the legislature passed the world's best workforce law, setting forth a framework for improving student success in Minnesota. One of the major goals is ensuring all students are prepared for success in college and career. However, unlike other goals in the framework, such as third grade reading or closing gaps between student groups and, and academic achievement, which both use the MCA for measurement, there is no measure across all schools on career and college readiness. Reporting on rigorous course taking using disaggregated data will point to actionable measures schools can take to reach this important goal and increase transparency to know which schools have developed best practices in this area and which are still in need of some improvement. House Bill 1712 would also add a data point to the world's best workforce reports measuring ninth grade students being on track for graduation. And by on track, that means a student had not failed more than one course per semester in one of four core academic areas, language arts, math, science, or social studies. There are 15 states who currently track and report this type of data, and it can serve as an early warning system to educators and to parents long before our ninth graders will take their high school MCA exams or even the ACT. In fact, there's ample research indicating ninth grade academic success is one of the best predictors of on-time high school graduation and entrance to post-secondary programs. Feedback on our research report from many stakeholders, including MDE, led to the inclusion of this provision in House File 1712. Sadly, Minnesota is one of the low, has one of the lowest graduation rates in the country for Native American, Latino, and Black students. The new indicators suggested in House File 1712 will be of benefit to school districts and to parents as we look for data other than the MCAs that can point to student success for high school graduation and college and career readiness. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, we thank Representative Keeler for offering this bill and I'm happy to respond to any questions. Thank you very much. Next on my list is Dolores Gabbard, Native American Homeschool Liaison with the Moorhead Public Schools. Ms. Gabbard, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chair Davney. My name is Dolores Gabbard and I work for Moorhead Area Public Schools as a Native American Homeschool Liaison. I also have children that attend school in Moorhead. As a parent and a district employee who provides services mm -hmm. for the underserved students in my district, I often hear about a push to provide equitable access to the tools that students need to be successful in their educational endeavors. Unfortunately, there is not a good system in place for measuring this initiative. I believe that requiring school districts to include in their world's best workforce reporting a breakdown of student subgroups would be beneficial in identifying barriers that underserved students may be experiencing in obtaining these tools. What I hope is that it would prevent students from falling through the cracks. I'm going to provide an example of how this amendment would be beneficial to underserved students. My own daughter, is the example of a student who I believe fell through the cracks. In elementary and middle school, she was identified as a student who was eligible for advanced classes and gifted and talented program, programming. In her freshman year, she was enrolled in advanced classes and consequently ended up failing those classes. What we didn't know was that she had attention deficit disorder that was not diagnosed until she was a senior in high school. Had there been a way to trigger this, I believe her academic performance and experience would have been very different. As it stands, there is not a required breakdown of student subgroups for districts to use in identifying if their practices are equitable. To the best of my knowledge, we're not asking districts to reinvent the wheel because subgroup information <clears throat> already exists in district data. I would hope that requiring this breakdown of subgroups not be used as a tool to point fingers and flag districts that are failing short. Instead, I would hope that it would be used as a tool to see where districts can be doing better. This data will be crucial information 
for districts as well as the state to create initiatives to ensure equitable access to AP, PSEO, and other rigorous classes for underserved students to increase college and career readiness. And I'd like to thank you for having me here today. Ms. Gabbard, Gabbard, thank you for joining us. Next on my list is Melisa Kalima, College and Career Center Coordinator uh, at North High School in Minneapolis with Achieve Minneapolis. Ms. Kalima, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Melisa Kalima, good morning, uh, committee chair and good morning, members of the committee. Thanks for letting me come today. Um, I am a College and Career Coordinator at North Community High School. North Community High School sits um, in uh, the inner city of Minnesota and serves as a tier one um, public high school. I, in working with Achieve, I'm one of 15 schools that we serve in and we are support staff to the counseling teams of those schools to lead initiatives around specifically career and college um, readiness within the school. That being said, I also hold a unique pr perspective as a graduate um, of North High School. At the time that I graduated, I was uniquely aware of the college and career data and that the city um, had labeled, uh, John Hopkins had come out with a study that labeled our school a dropout factory. Um, in, graduate, in my graduating year, the school graduated 33% of our class. Um, and so I'm coming back, to, um, coming back to North High now as a college and career access professional, I hold a unique perspective in wanting to see those outcomes uh, definitely changed um, and wanting to see those outcomes um, named for in an actionable way that we can make change around as um, we're working in the field. Um, so I urge you to support this bill. I echo uh, what I've heard earlier around the need for capacity building and the need for transparency when it comes to what are the actions that we take as prof professionals when we see that our school graduation rates um, are the outcomes. So we need more than the outcomes. We need to know along the way how we got there. Um, and so we need um, data around who's failing at, for, how do we have a student fail for four years in a row and then be surprised that they aren't able to access um, kind of college outcomes or, or career success. Um, we need this data along the way in order to do the work. Um, and so I, I, I hear on track data and I see this stuff kind of in my daily uh, routine with work and I see the need for it to expand. On track data right now tells us on a weekly basis, students that are failing um, and while that information is um, good to know as a counselor, we don't then know what are the best practices or what are the other set, or what are the other indicators that we need to be able to respond. Um, also, we don't have a built-in curriculum when it comes to college and career readiness. So a way to have smaller milestones along the way, a student accessing a college tour or a student um, having a career experience or a career internship. We don't have those milestones built into the the breadth of our work. Uh, and that's what this bill is doing for us. It's really expanding the frameworks in which we um, have actionable solutions to the outcomes. Um, so I urge you to support the bill and thank you so much for letting me speak today. Thank you, Ms. Kalima. Uh, last on my, excuse me, last on my list is Kyrie Lewis, elementary education major from Augsburg University. Uh, Ms. Ms. Lewis, welcome to the committee. Please state oh, your name for the record. Yes, sir. And proceed. <laughs> oh. Mr. Lewis, uh, thanks for having me today. Oh, I'm, my apologies. <laughs> I'm Kyrie Lewis, uh, second year at Augsburg, pursuing a career in elementary education. Um, while doing this, I have been able to reflect a lot of my experience throughout grade school. I was not the typical AP IB student. Um, before moving to Minnesota, uh, my freshman year, I failed five classes and um, I like that collecting data um, in this bill is like helping to keep track of our freshmen who are on track to graduate because I was definitely not one of those students on track to graduation. Um, but I had a complete 180 just simply by change of environment. And I decided that I wanted to challenge myself and take these IB and AP classes. So some of the classes that I took, I took IB English, IB Math Studies, AP European History, um, IB History of Africa and the Middle East, and a few others. Um, now that I'm in college, I see that these classes have um, helped me a lot because just preparing me for the college rigor, um, study, study skills, and many other things, um, it's been extremely beneficial. While in these classes in high school, um, I went to Champlain Park High School, which is a very large high school, about 3,000 kids. Um, in a lot of these classes, I was the only student of color, and some of them there was two or three of us. 
And I think that having the data and, and this, this bill would, would help to support, you know, underrepresented student, students and that we would have more opportunities because getting to college is one step, but actually getting to college and being successful is a completely different thing, especially if you're, especially if you already feel like you're out of place, if you're a first generation college student and everything is unfamiliar. I think that by taking these classes and being ready for a uh, college rigor, it kind of helps you move forward a little bit, right? So get closer to the starting line where everyone else is. Um, The, the classes for me, they they were great. Um, I think that this, this bill would help a lot, especially when it comes to encouraging students to take these classes. So yeah, that's really mostly all I have to say about it. <laughs> all right. Um, Mr. Lewis, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks Appreciate for it. having me today. Uh, members, any questions for the author or the testifiers? Uh, Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess the question for the author, does this bill apply to all schools in the state or is it only those that are failing? Um, you know, I, we heard some compelling discussion from Ms. Kalima about a failing school district that might benefit from this. I, I look at the mandates again that this bill places on schools and those that uh, are at graduation rates of high 90s, uh, sometimes 100%, I, I wonder about placing these additional mandates on them. So I'm curious of whether this applies to all school districts or not. Uh, Representative Keeler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Draskowski. That's a good question. And I think to do things equitable, uh, we have to do them across the state. You know, if we have people that are graduating at 100%, that's great, but it's good for us to see the data, um, see what areas they're doing well, but also adding the data to segregation. Just because students are graduating doesn't mean that they were taking the rigorous coursework um, as well. And so the idea here is that uh, we're going to be fair across the board and not just add more reports to different school districts that. Um, need the help, but it would be equitable across the entire state. Um, I don't know if Ms. Loon, you want to add anything? Ms. Loon? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Draskowski for the question. Um, no, Representative Keeler is absolutely right. I mean, these would be data points added to the world's best workforce reports, which all schools are required to do, uh, regardless of their, of their current uh, results and, and academic achievement for their students. So, um, this would be for all for all schools. Representative Draskowski. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just quickly, um, thank you, Representative Keeler, for bringing this forward. And just wanted to voice my support and wish you well going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, Members of the public, when this and members, uh, when this hearing was posted, the public was provided with instruction on how to sign up to testify during the public portion of the bill hearing. We received no requests from the public to testify. Uh, seeing, taking a pause, seeing no other, oh, that's what I get for pausing. Representative Jordan, welcome to question time. Yes, thank you, Chair Dabney. I am pretty offended to just hear that North High was referred to as a failing high school. I think that's incredibly offensive to the educators, to the community and the students that attend North High. North High School is a wonderful school. Students there are achieving. A student from North High just played in the Super Bowl. Graduation rates are up. Enrollment is up. There are many, many wonderful programs at North High School, and it is extremely inappropriate and offensive for any member of this committee to say that it is a failing school. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Jordan. Good points. Representative Keeler, any closing statements? Oh, Representative Dreskowski. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, uh, Representative Jordan, I wonder what rate, at what point of graduation rate would we consider a school failing? We heard from uh, mm -hmm. one testifier that said that, uh, and, and she uh, uh, beat all odds in her particular school district. So congratulations, she worked her tail off, I'm sure, uh, to get to where she did and, and is excelling in life and, and excelling right now. And hats off to her. But 33% graduation rate is not acceptable. It's horrible. 
And I believe that's failing. Now, if you're offended by that, you can be offended by that. Everybody's offended by something. I'm offended by a failure when we got taxpayer money that is going out to these schools and the schools are not succeeding for their students. That's, that's what offends me. So if you wanna know what offends me, uh, Representative Jordan, that's what offends me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, Representative Drazkowski, I'm, I'm gonna try to avoid uh, this committee descending into uh, an offensive uh, wrestling match here. Uh, but I do believe it's uh, not appropriate to refer to schools as failing. It's not helpful to refer to schools as failing. Every school in the state uh, is engaging their students uh, and with the students' strengths, as well as with uh, the challenges that they uh, are bringing, bringing to the school setting. Uh, what has happened in, in this state is we have failed to provide the resources needed for the, some school communities and more importantly, some students and families uh, to succeed. The failure, uh, Representative Drazkowski, is on us. It's not on the students of North High School or any other school in the state. The failure is on us. 134 members of the House, 67 members of the Senate. But I would urge in the future uh, that, you not, uh, that, that you not engage in unproductive uh, behavior such as referring to schools as failing. Representative Thompson, briefly, please. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you. Um, I, I 100 percent support um, this bill, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it makes sense um, to help the communities that really need the help, and that's our job. Our job is to help the children that are uh, behind. Our job is to help the communities that really need an extra push. And the communities that don't need an extra push have to pitch in. And so, you know, a lot of times, Chair, I'll say, as you said, be real quick, a lot of times our lived experiences are not the lived experiences of other people. So they wipe it off as things not needed um, also. But the problem why we're, our kids are failing is because we keep making decisions without the people who are going to be affected by the decisions that we're making a part of the decision-making table and giving them decision-making power. Um, I can't make decisions for Mankato because I have no idea how people live in Mankato. I can't tell you how to fix problems in Mankato because I've never lived there. But I can tell you the problems that we have in St. Paul in Minneapolis, Roseville, Robbinsdale, and these areas. And so just because our lived experiences are not the lived experiences of other uh, people doesn't mean that you just wipe them off as rhetoric. And so I just wanna make sure that we're cautious and I 100% support, uh, and I thank you for bringing this, this bill to this committee because it makes sense for our community. I just wanna say thank you. Thank you, Representative Thompson. Uh, Representative Berg, I think this is your third chance at a brief closing statement. Uh, excuse me, Representative Keeler, my apologies. Thank you, Chair Dabney. Third time's a charm, I guess, right? And I appreciate your leadership um, in this effort. I guess my closing statements are that I think we all agree that education is so important for our next generation, and this just gives us the tools. Um, we hear it often that when we know better, we do better. Um, this is just a movement to do that, taking into consideration all of the things that we need um, to collect to tell the best stories about our students and provide the supports that we need. I would appreciate um, any support moving forward in this. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, Representative Keeler. And with that, Rep Representative Zhang renews his motion that House File 1712, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in a future bill. With that, members, uh, floor session at 1215, uh, and we are adjourned. Thank you all very much for your time today. Thank you to the testifiers.